So we're, we're looking for people that, that have gone someplace that we want to be going. And it's in all areas of life. And it would never be just one person. So let's say this man is a multimillionaire. I think I can learn some things from him. Even though he says some things I've heard before. And what he does is model the same thing. So here's a little clip where he's talking about there's 300 billionaires with a B in the United States. So when he was broke, he used to take millionaires out to lunch and listen. Now that he's a millionaire, he takes billionaires out to lunch and listens and takes notes. Make sense? We are all wired to receive, to steward, to multiply, and to give away more than we received. Even if it's to your own posterity, it, it's, it's intended that they would have an inheritance. And our inheritance includes all kinds of things, not just material things or money, right? But what's most valuable in regards to money is, is how to use money and not have money hurt you. I've seen just gifts hurt people. But concisely, he said that the billionaire that he took out to lunch recently gave him two things. He says there's two things. Boy, he got his, no, nope, he was ready. He said, I recognize that on every show that you do, you always give something to someone in need. You're always giving to someone else. He said, always give. There's not a billionaire on the planet that doesn't generously give regularly. You've all heard that before, haven't you? And the second thing is he's going to recommend a book. He says, I read this book to my grandkids every time I have them over. Every day we read this book. And we're all thinking, what, what book is he reading to his kids? I'm thinking Proverbs, of course. I was wrong. How many of you have ever read the book, um, The Tortoise and the Hare? He reads, this billionaire reads to his tortoise and the hare to his grandchildren every day to just reinforce that idea like Proverbs says, those that are looking for rich, quick schemes will, will run into greater poverty. But wealth is built a little bit at a time. Do you understand? And it is my heart and my desire that you would be at liberty to sow into and to help liberally anybody that you're prompted to at any moment in time that we go from at one point needing help to then learning to pull on the wisdom of heaven where we're going to be a resource to others. How many of you would, how many of you would rather be, live a life looking for a handout, looking for a resource? How many of you would prefer option B where you are a resource? Bless you. Okay, now, if we could take that and transfer it to those things that are of eternal value, those are temporally valuable and they have a place. But right now we have the opportunity to receive from heaven through the Son of God, Andre Rabe, eternal treasures and eternal values. Are you ready? Will you welcome Andre? <laughs> limitations of just dogma and the way in which we communicate. I pray that our hearts would resonate as we, as we just recognize your voice, your ideas, your communication. Thank you, Papa. Thank you for your eagerness to communicate that you have wired us to hear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord has made them both. <laughs> so we so ready, Papa, Abba, to receive from you. Honor you. Amen. I want to um, talk today about something very simple. It's, it's really a question that uh, somebody brought to Jesus in Luke 10 verse 25. A, a lawyer comes to Jesus and he says, uh, what is, uh, how do I inherit uh, eternal life? Now, uh, how we've often interpreted it is, how do I get to heaven? 
Now, I think there's much more to this question because um, inheritance was the ultimate insider that got the inheritance. In those days, not even the girls got inheritance. It was just the son, often the firstborn son, that, that would get the inheritance. So, so he's coming to Jesus and he says, give me the secret to being an insider to, to the life of God. And, and that is what I want to speak to uh, about today, is what is the secret to... You know, we, we heard beforehand that there is, there is a place of satisfaction. There is a place of contentment. Now, this is maybe this question asked in a different way. God, Jesus, tell us what... What is the secret to getting to this place of contentment? And, um, you know, often, often it is promoted that just hunger is, is a, a, and desperation for God is a good spiritual sense. But often, if you find yourself continually hungering and thirsting after God, what it often means is that what you are currently believing is not working. So if you find yourself continually hungering and thirsting, <laughs> Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because I'm going to keep them hungry and thirsty all their lives. No, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they will be satisfied. You see, the, the, it's great to hunger and thirst when you've never encountered him. But hey, if, if you think you've come to a place of relationship with God and after 10, 15 years you're still in a place of hungering and thirsting, then maybe what you're partaking of is not Christ. Because John 6, verse 38, Jesus says that if you believe in me, if you partake of me, you will never hunger and never thirst. He doesn't come to just keep you hungry your whole life. He comes to satisfy. And so, yes, the, much of religion would try and promote the idea that to continually be hungry and pursuing and, uh, and searching and desperately doing whatever it takes to try and get closer, they would try and promote that that kind of hunger is a good thing because religion knows that the only thing it has to offer you is more hunger and more thirst. But Jesus, at the great day of that feast, when he watches people, uh, and after they've done all their festive activities, he says, whoever is still hungry, whoever is still thirsting, <laughs> come to me. So I've got something to offer that our, your religious rites and your religious activities can never do. <laughs> and so, yeah, in Luke uh, 10, 25, uh, a lawyer, now a lawyer was just in, in those days a person, a, a scribe, somebody highly educated within the scriptures because their law and the scriptures was the same. And so, uh, and in the other gospels it would actually say that it was a scribe. So this is a religious leader, a lawyer comes to Jesus saying, what should I do to inherit eternal life? What is this secret to being an insider to the life of God. And Jesus says, well, see, his language is all about, I want secret access. I want exclusive understanding. And then Jesus' answer points to something that is accessible publicly. And he says, well, what does the scripture say? How do you read them? Jesus knew full well that to read the scriptures is to interpret them. 
And so the, the lawyer answers him by combining two verses, one out of Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, which says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And he combines it with Leviticus 19 verse 18, which says, you will love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, our love for God takes on a specific form. It is expressed in our love to our neighbor. And so he, he does a brilliant combination of these two verses, and Jesus says, wow, that's a brilliant answer. I, I like that. <laughs> you, you answered correctly. And maybe he was a little bit disappointed with the fact that he brought such a complicated question to Jesus. And after Jesus extracts an answer from him, Jesus basically says, that's good. You know, uh, and uh, no, I want a more complicated answer. <laughs> and um, so Luke's gospel says wanting to justify himself, uh, and he often uses that term in somebody who wants to make himself look good or, or look justified, wanting to justify himself. He, he says, but who's my neighbor? Because if you look further in um, Leviticus 19 verse 18, it seems like it is only speaking to those who are part of the household of Israel because it says you shall not hold a grudge or, or do vengeance to those of your own household because you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But then a little bit further in Leviticus, it kind of blurs the definition by saying if a foreigner comes to your country and somebody from the outside dwells amongst you, you shall love him as you love yourself because you yourself were foreigners. And so that kind of blurs the line and, and I think this is what makes the lawyer a bit nervous. I want the minimum legal requirement for who my neighbor is. Because if I've got to love my neighbor as myself, I don't want the circle to be too big. I want to know who my neighbor is. Help me out here, Lord. I want a precise way, an exact way of living between the parameters in this narrow road of how to access the secret life of God. And Jesus starts off replying to him with a story. And he says, a, a certain man was traveling and he happened to fall amongst thieves. You, you, certain things just happen. And these thieves robbed him. They beat him half to death. Death, uh, uh, and leave him on the side of the road. Now a priest comes and he's traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he happens to, uh, uh, to pass by that uh, man. Uh, and everything in Jesus' language avoids the kind of precise definition that this lawyer wants. I want the exact principles, the exact keys, the right steps to know that I'm in the will of God. And everything in Jesus' language has to do with a very fluid, by chance, things happen. And what happens isn't always perfect. This guy just happens to fall among thieves, because in real life things happen that's chaotic. Things happen that are tragic. And, and in the midst of real life, a priest, the one who is supposed to have access to the life of God like no one else, he passes by and he sees this man and he quickly walks to the other side of the road on his way now it doesn't give us any psychological insight into this person and the priest might have had very good reasons to avoid a man that's dead because as a priest they would perform sacred 
rituals. And within these sacred rituals, you could not defile yourself by touching death, by getting involved with anything that's defiled. So their very definition of having access to the secret things of God meant that we need to avoid the chaos and the disaster and the defilement of ordinary life. So he had very good reasons to avoid this man. And a Levite comes and he does the same. And then, you know, Jesus, in one of his classic versions of a story, always makes the most annoying people the heroes. Now, the Samaritans are those who are not total outsiders. They are the people that are actually very much like the Jews. They worship the same God, but they worship him at a different place. They don't acknowledge Jerusalem as the only center for worship. They, they worship at Mount Gerizim, I, uh, I think I remember correctly. So they've got a lot in common. These are the people which are so much part of the community, but it's just those little differences that drives you mad that made the Jews totally disdain them more than even pagans because they, they claim to worship the same God. You know, it's like other Christians can be more irritating <laughs> than uh, just complete unbelievers because they claim to believe in the same God. But goodness, they say things a bit different than me. And so, <laughs> so yeah, Jesus makes the Samaritan, a certain Samaritan, just by chance. It's amazing how Jesus speaks about entering into the secret life of God as something that can happen in the ebb and the flow and the chance of what happens in life. And so by chance this man happens to pass by the same road and he sees this man beaten half to death and it says he was moved with compassion. Now, the most direct translation would be he was gut-wrenched. See, when he saw this man, maybe it looked like his gut, he was gutted. <laughs> In reality, there's blood, there's stuff all over. This is defilement. This is the kind of chaos and tragedy we try and avoid in life the kind of chaos that will separate us from this serene place of personal encounter with the Lord. And Jesus says it's the very fact that he allowed this situation to deeply affect him that started giving him entrance into the secret life of God. And so his gut rings by the sight and he goes over to the, the man and he starts binding up his wounds, throwing wine, which was the only kind of disinfectant, general disinfectant, onto the wounds, loading the man onto his animal. He takes him to an inn. He cares for him and the next day he, he gives the innkeeper two denarius. That's like two days worth of wages saying, you take care of him, I'm, I'm going to go about my business. You see, he didn't become psychological and in every other way so involved in this person's life that he couldn't keep on functioning and doing his business. He, he went along his business as he always did, but he, he made the provision and made a plan to keep on caring for this person. And he said, whatever I owe you, I will pay you on my return. And then he asks the lawyer, who was a neighbor to that man? You see, the lawyer starts off with the question, give me a precise definition of who my neighbor is. 
so that I may know who I should love. And he ends up with the answer that neighborliness is not something that is defined out there. Neighborliness is something you create. And so he says, well, who was a neighbor to that man? And he says, I guess it's the one who showed mercy. And he, he kind of, the wording that he uses is very much the same as what's written in Hosea when God says, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. Because you see, in our perverted concept of the sacred, the priest would avoid the defilement, the guts of another human being. But he would enter the temple and with the sacrifice of their lambs and, and, and their animals, he would eat the entrails of, of the animal in honor <laughs> of the sacred of accessing God. But he would miss the opportunity to get involved in this victim. You see, there's two ways of understanding sacrifice. <laughs> and the wrong way of understanding sacrifice will keep you so involved with ritual that you miss the fact that true sacrifice is getting involved with victims getting involved and allowing yourself to be moved <laughs> by the lives of others. And so Jesus starts saying, you know what? The secret to entering into the life of God <laughs> is when you allow yourself to again feel and be moved by others. There's no, there's no freedom in independence. <laughs> freedom is only found in who you bind yourself to. Now this is what we find in, in the language of Romans 6. He says, you are a slave either to sin, which leads to death, or you're a slave of righteousness, that leads to life. In other words, freedom is not found in independence. Freedom is found in who you are enslaved to. <laughs> because as a being that's made to reflect, you will always be connected to what you reflect. And so he's starting to to help this person understand. You know, you know, if I have to translate it into our modern version of what this lawyer was asking, maybe our modern version is, tell me, what is the secret? Maybe the modern version is, tell me the secret to knowing the will of God. Give me the, the, the three steps and the five principles, the activities that I need to get involved in to make sure that I don't miss God's will, that I stay on this perfect road that he has planned for me with precision. And if I step out of it, oh heavens, even God himself gets nervous. this is what this lawyer wants to know. <laughs> and this is how we may be translated into today's language. Is we have this idea that God has planned every detail of your life. And if you step off this path and you go in the wrong way for a month, it's going to take you at least a month to get back onto that path again. Now Jesus speaks about the will of God as something that can happen in the ebb and flow, the chance of life, where you suddenly find yourself in the midst of chaos, in the midst of circumstances that are not perfect, in the midst of people that are suffering, in the midst of pain. It is right there. 
<laughs> that you can enter the secret life of God. <laughs> uh, you see, the idea that God has got everything perfectly planned, everything perfectly worked out, and we just need to find that will and walk in it. You know what? It, it sounds so spiritual. It sounds so great. But if God knows every detail of everything that still is going to happen in perfect clarity, if nothing surprises him, it must be the most boring existence there is. Of course, of course, it says God knows the end from the beginning. Of course He has a goal. Of course He knows where He wants to take you to. And that, that end goal, trans, Jesus translates that end goal in, in John 14 verse 20 where He says, In that day you will know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I'm in the Father, I'm in you. In other words, God's purpose, of course, is unity, is this place of tranquility and life and love. But how we get there, he has not determined. See, the, the, the offensive thing about Jesus is that we, we wished for a God who would just come and enforce his will upon this world. But Jesus comes and he says, I put myself in your hands. You do to me what you want to. <laughs> this is offensive. We want a powerful, strong God that enforces his will. And Jesus comes to reveal a God weak enough to be killed by human hands. And so in a way he places an enormous gift in our hands and says, hmm, I give you a lot of freedom to decide how we're going to get to that goal. <laughs> I've not determined this, this path. Things are going to happen. Things are going to happen in life. Things are going to happen by chance. Now when Mary Ann and myself we planned a, a, a trip into Europe uh, a while ago and we were going to visit 10 different countries in 10 weeks and we're going we're to minister at different groups in every country and it was quite exciting planning all this and places we've never been to. We were going to go to Malta and then Austria and, then, uh, and just meet with little home groups and declare this gospel and there was great joy in planning and anticipating those events, but the joy of actually living those events, of actually participating in those events, was much greater than the joy of anticipation. And part of what made that joy so great is that stuff happened that we did not plan. You see, God is excited about your life. Not because he has perfectly planned every detail, but because he has given you freedom and he wants to participate with you in your life and giving you choices to say, you decide which way this is going. And let me give you a hint. Part of what's going to make this journey incredibly exciting is when along the way you happen to come upon people who need help and you allow yourself to be moved with compassion. Those are going to be the events that is going to take your life beyond boring existence. <laughs> into a place where you discover that I only fully live when I start giving myself unreservedly, without any guarantee of any return. 
<laughs> Just in the act of giving myself, that is life. Now this is why Paul comes down so strong on the, on the Christians in Galatia who heard this gospel and then very soon afterwards some of the other religious brothers came back to the community and they said, you know what Paul told you? You know, it's very good, but I just want to remind you that this Abraham that Paul spoke about, he was still circumcised, he still did things. In other words, you know all the stories about what God did for you in Christ, that's great, but let's get down to the real business of what you need to do. See, religion is always focused on man's contribution, what man needs to do. The gospel is always focused on God's action in Christ that inspires a new way of living. Not, not through precise laws. And so Paul in, in chapter 5 says, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. It wasn't so that you can just be manipulated and controlled by God in another way. <laughs> it was for freedom that you find a relationship where God opens up possibilities. God is the God of infinite possibilities. He's not the God of one predetermined path. He's the God who would not even limit himself to just one possible future. <laughs> now that's why when we like to have things like that lawyer, we like to have it precisely defined, don't we? Because then we know whether we're right or wrong, whether we're in or out. But just when we think we've got everything precisely defined, the end of the book of Revelations, where all the bad people are somewhere else, and all the good people are here, and we're now going to be happy ever after, because we're never going to encounter evil again. Just when we think we've got everything sorted out, God says, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You know what? I forgot to close the gate. And I'm never going to close it. And, and what's more, I am the God, behold, who makes all things new. The Bible does not contain the end of the story. <laughs> because God has not even limited himself to the Scriptures. The Scriptures points to a reality greater than themselves. To the God who cannot be captured in language or text. But the God who when he wanted to show us what human life looks like, didn't communicate it in another story. That stepped right into our human condition. Into our human flesh became us. And said, this is a message, this is a word <laughs> that you're going to encounter, not in theory. But I want you to encounter this life and this message as human life. God comes to you disguised as your own life. <laughs> oh. And in the ebb and flow in the chances and in the disasters and in the chaos of this life is where he wants to give you access to the secret life of God. This secret life of God is not found some other time and some other place. Eternity is not the opposite of time. Eternity is finding the beauty and the meaning of the temple. Eternity is starting to see what God sees in this life. 
This is why the most authentic message of Jesus, if you, if you follow the theologians that wants to strip all the Gospels to the basic things that they say, we are sure that Jesus said this. <laughs> it is the simple message, change your way of thinking. The kingdom of God is here. <laughs> Change your way of thinking. This is not about some paradise, some other place, some other time. Change the way you think. It is this life, right here, right now, that has meaning. That has value. <laughs> oh, glory. This doesn't mean that there aren't dimensions and beyond our wildest imagination. This doesn't mean that we won't be reunited with our loved ones, etc. But, but it's almost like Jesus is starting to say, come on, guys. It is allowing yourself to be connected to love right here <laughs> and right now that's going to give you access to the life of God. That's why in John 17 verse 3, when, when Jesus defines eternal life, he says, this is absolute eternal life, that you know the Father and His Son. In other words, he doesn't define eternal life in terms of its duration. Neither does he define eternal life in terms of its location. He defines eternal life as something that you know. As something that you become aware of. <laughs> ah, God's so excited about your life. Because He never planned you as just some pet that He observes from a distance. He planned you as the being in whom he can participate in life. You are the being when God thought, what would it be like if for me to experience this world and for this world to experience me? That's when he reimagined himself in human form. That is why you are called the image and the likeness of God. <laughs> you are the form of existence in which God reimagined himself. Obviously, there's a distinction that remains because there's no romance without distinction. I'm so glad when we fell in love, Mary Ann didn't just vaporize and become one with me. I'm glad that we, there's a there's a distinction that remains. And although we became one, the distinction is what makes the relationship so exciting. Because there's a flow of desire, of love, of affection. And so there's no separation between God and his creation. But there is a distinction. And this distinction is exciting because it makes romance possible. <laughs> I, just, yeah, I just want to encourage you and end off with this. <sighs> Your life is God's opportunity to live, to move, and to have his being in this world. And that's why he's so excited about you. <laughs> that's why he wants to participate that's why he gives you freedom and even if you think I've taken the wrong path for 30 years it's going to take me forever to get back now the secret to being right in the middle of the will of God is to right there in the middle of your mess, allow yourself again to love.
Because when you love, God is being himself in you. When you love, you are right in the center, right in the sweet spot of the will of God. No matter what mess is happening around you. You see, what makes your life significant is not the fact that there is no chaos. What makes your life so meaningful is not the fact that everything works out perfectly. It's in the midst of meaningless chaos that God somehow still links our story and our life together in a way that tells a meaningful story. It's because your life happens in the midst of this chaos that makes it so significant. And the resurrection is God's declaration that anything's possible. You might have come to the end of your story, <laughs> the end of your imagination, but he is the God of infinite possibilities. And he's saying, don't limit your future to a memory of a fallen past. Your future doesn't have to be bound to your past. You are in the hands of the God who makes all things new. And he's saying, come on. Come on. Can you imagine with me? Can you allow yourself to just for a moment dream with me? What would it be like if God invades this body <laughs> and starts loving this world extravagantly? And when God possesses you, <laughs> the beauty of this possession and the mystery of this union is that it doesn't dissolve you. It makes you more truly and fully yourself. <laughs> God has got no suspicion towards his own image and likeness. <laughs> He's excited about your life. Thank you, Papa. Ah, you know, the, the only thing God wants to change about you is the things that you cling on to that you might think is you, but it's not really you. The real you, God doesn't want to change. He wants to set it free to be itself. <laughs> He has no suspicion towards his own image and likeness. He trusts you. And so even in Galatians 5, when Paul says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, he ends off and he says, don't allow this freedom to become an excuse to devour one another, an opportunity to devour one another, one another but rather Love. In other words, freedom is no longer this place in which I so isolate myself from others that I can do what I want to without being limited by others. Freedom now becomes an opportunity to love and that means that others are not a limitation to my freedom. They are the extension of my freedom. That's why God sees you as an extension of his freedom. <laughs> In you, he has an opportunity to love beyond himself. <laughs> and the God who is love, loves to do that more than anything else. <laughs> so Jesus takes this love to the absolute extreme when he says, love your enemies. <laughs> There's nothing about our enemies' actions that are lovable. But it's when we see beyond what they even see themselves. It's when we see the value, the image and likeness 
in which mankind was made, that we can start to call forth, not through our theory, not through our rhetoric, but through our love, we, we break the dormancy of the image and likeness of God in others. Ah, thank you, Papa. Thank you for your beautiful words, Jesus, your teaching that shows us that in the midst of real life, we have access. <laughs> we have access to the compassion of God to move us and to connect us And to give life meaning way beyond what we could imagine ourselves. Thank you for this freedom. This freedom to give ourselves away. <laughs> and discover ourselves as we lose ourselves. Thank you, Papa. We honor you. I thank you for the ideas, the thoughts that have that you have communicated even beyond words today. I thank you for the creative plans and ideas that's birthing and racing within people's spirits and hearts right now. That you give us creative, artistic ways of loving and giving ourselves. <laughs> thank you, Papa. Amen. Amen. Thank you.